This brisket's been smoking for 11 hours and I haven't touched it once. I've been sleeping during that whole time and I've been using this special charcoal in the firebox to maintain the heat. And this little device up here on the stack has been controlling the draft. So I'm gonna open this up now and we'll see if you can really set and forget a brisket on an offset smoker. Going in hot, going in hot. Okay, 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 okay. All right, there's a guy, there's a guy. There's a guy, I got him, I got him. Boom, boom. Steve. Hey. Uh, Melissa's gonna come for lunch next Sunday and I promised her brisket. Oh, for lunch? Yeah, for lunch on Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, how am I gonna look after you and cook brisket overnight? All right, I don't wanna stay up all night next weekend babysitting a smoker and looking after my baby. So I've got about eight days to figure out how to set up the brisket the night before on the offset smoker, go to bed for 11 hours, wake up and the brisket is done. It basically needs to be as simple as a pellet grill. And during my research, everyone on the internet seems to indicate that this is impossible. You can't run an offset smoker without tending it for more than maybe five hours. And even if you could, the brisket would just taste like charcoal. Well. Challenge accepted, internet. Let's get smoking. If I want my Oklahoma Joes to go for 11 hours unassisted, I'm gonna need some charcoal that burns nice and clean. Lump charcoal came to mind immediately because it's less refined, it's closer to what actually burning real wood would be like in the Oklahoma Joes, and it's just supposed to have a better taste at the end of the day, especially if you're using the method that I'm gonna be using. So the first thing I tried was a full basket of the lump charcoal with a chimney of lit coals dumped on top of it. This is what's known as the minion method. So you have a basket or an area of unlit coals and then you light some coals on the center or at one end and it's supposed to slowly light the other coals over time and create a consistent long burn. Well, it didn't really work out that way. The problem with this method is that it just lit the charcoal basket way too fast. I probably used too many starting charcoals from the full chimney to start it. And it just like got out of control. The temperature spiked above like 400 at one point. And that is way too hot for a brisket. It's gonna burn the brisket. So I can't really rely on this method, I need to adjust it a little bit. For my second test, I added just a few lit chunks of charcoal to the basket this time. My hope was that the charcoal would light a little bit slower and create steadier temperatures over a longer period of time. And it kind of worked. The temperatures rose a lot slower and it lasted a little bit longer, but they still spiked above 300 and they got way too high which was no good. I couldn't use this method, so I had to throw it out the window. But with the experiment already failed, I took this opportunity to test the dampers a little bit. I had previously been working with the dampers wide open. So the intake damper was 100% open and the exhaust stack damper was 100% open. And in retrospect, that was probably letting way too much air in. It was feeding the coals way too much and they were burning way too hot. So what I learned that was really interesting is when I shut the intake damper down about 95%, like so there was like very little space for the air to get in, it didn't affect the temperature barely at all. It affected it by maybe a couple of degrees. And then when I opened the intake damper all the way, I moved over to the exhaust damper and I closed that down about 50%. That had a drastic effect on the temperature. So why did this happen? Well, I did a bunch of research and what I found is that to make a long story short, the exhaust damper controls your temperatures a lot more than the intake damper. Now, if you want to get scientific about this, and I will because I'm a nerd, nerd, nerd. the reason for this is the stack effect. According to the stack effect, air buoyancy is caused by the pressure difference between the cold outside air and the hot inside air inside the smoker. This air buoyancy causes the heat to flow into the firebox and feed the fire and then it flows up and over your meat and out the stack. Basically what I'm describing is hot air rises, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because as the hot air rises, it's creating a vacuum in the firebox. It's creating negatively charged air of negative pressure, and that negative pressure is sucking in more air, which isn't just pushing all that air through the smoker, it's actually feeding the fire with more oxygen. And you can actually measure that pressure differential with a little device called a manometer. Just as I thought, ultra manly. Actually, I think it's pronounced manometer. I just like to say manometer because I think it's cool. In this case, the pressure difference was minus one Pascal, and that is enough pressure difference to move that whole system of air 
through the smoker and over the meat, which is actually cooking the meat. And using a wind flow meter, you can actually see that the airflow into the firebox is really steady when the exhaust damper is open all the way but it slows down a lot when I close it just halfway. So we'll look at this picture for a second. When this exhaust is fully open, this thing is humming along. It's sucking in air into the firebox. All of that air is rising up over the meat. This is where we're taking the temperature and it's flowing out of the stack. The faster it flows, the more negative pressure it creates in the firebox, the more air it sucks in, the faster it goes over the meat and out the stack and it raises the temperature. If all of a sudden you shut down this stack, then all of a sudden, all of that air, it kind of backs up. There's nowhere for it to go. It stops sucking in more oxygen to feed the fire. So the firebox cools down. You're getting less hot air flowing over the meat. So the temperature goes way down. But conversely, if you shut down just the intake damper with that exhaust still open, it's still creating that negative pressure in the firebox. And it's sucking the air in through that smaller opening even harder. So it's doing double duty but it's still pulling in a lot of oxygen and all of that air is still flowing over the meat. It's maintaining temperature. So that is why this stack opening affects the temperature right here way more than this intake opening down at the firebox side. Now that I knew how the dampers could control the temperature, I set up the Oklahoma Joe with a full basket and lit just one corner of it. I had the intake damper closed about 95% of the way and the exhaust damper closed about 50%. So still a pretty good opening on the exhaust damper, but the intake shut almost all the way. This gave me about five hours of burn time at a temperature zone between about 200 to 260 degrees, which was a huge improvement over my last test. But I'd still need to double that and more if I wanted to get to 11 hours of burn time at a low and slow temperature range of about 200 to 250. It was clear that the lump charcoal just didn't last long enough to get the job done. So I had to turn to a longer lasting briquette even though I'm not a huge fan of briquettes because they're highly processed and they make me a little bit ill when I use them. I start like sniffling, I get allergy and flu-like symptoms and I get headaches. So I hate using briquettes, but they last a lot longer. So I thought that's probably what I needed to get the job done here. With a full basket of briquettes, I got about eight hours of heat, which was definitely getting closer to what I needed. But the problem was the temperature was still spiking to about 300 and then it gradually went down over time. So I was getting the longer burn times that I wanted, but I was still getting a temperature spike. I almost needed a way to keep the vents open during the beginning part of the cook so that I could ramp up the temperature and then somehow automatically close down the vents about halfway through when the temperature started spiking to reduce the temperature at great level. But I didn't really know anything that could do that besides some sort of makeshift electrical device that I'd have to make myself which wasn't gonna happen. And to make matters worse, I was getting more and more sick from this charcoal briquette smoke. Uh, my headaches were getting worse. I was like feeling like I had the flu or something. I thought I had coronavirus at one point because I was like getting flu-like symptoms and I was freaking out. And I didn't learn until later that it was actually the charcoal that was causing these symptoms. And I was about to give up at that point and just throw in the towel. So I just went to bed defeated. And that's when I had a dream. You know, see, the answers won't always come easily in your barbecue journey, but it's important that you never stop looking for them. Who knows, maybe the answer has been right in front of you all along. All you need to do is open your mind and open your eyes. In my mind, in my eyes. Open my mind, open my eyes, open my eyes. Whoa! Uh, of course, the tip-top temp. So this is the tip top temp. It's actually made for a Weber kettle, but I'm gonna use it for my Oklahoma Joes and I'm gonna put it right on the stack to control the temperature as the cook goes on. What it does is it uses a bimetal coil and as the temperature, the airflow through the stack coming out here heats up, it's heating up that bimetal coil and it's expanding and then it's shutting down this little flapper valve right here. Really cool, really ingenious. There's no electronics, it's really simple. And as you guys will recall, the more closed the stack is, the less airflow, the less temperature at great level. So as this thing heats up, if I have it set to the right setting, then at exactly the point when it starts getting maybe above 300, 
this thing will really start closing down and evening out the temperatures. So this will prevent the temperature spike problem and it'll keep the temperatures more stable throughout the cook. But I still have another problem. I need to get longer burn times as well. So to solve that problem, I fashioned some makeshift dividers from some old barbecue grates from my barbecue that I don't use anymore because I have like nine different smokers and I don't need to use a gas grill anymore. And then I set up the briquettes so that I would light them on one end and they would slowly snake through the basket and light the other ones. This is called the snake method. It's a modification of the minion method. And it's supposed to last longer and produce more consistent heat over a longer period of time than the minion method alone. When I tested this out, I found that I didn't get a temperature spike. So the tip top temp was doing its job, but I was only getting about five hours of burn time still. And again, the smoke from the charcoal briquettes was making me more and more sick. So I had to find a type of charcoal that wouldn't make me sick. So it burnt cleaner. It needed to burn hot and it needed to burn longer. So it needed to be better than briquettes. It needed to be better than lump charcoal and it needed to be clean and not make me sick. So that's a pretty tall order, but I found exactly the charcoal that solved all of these problems. So this is coconut charcoal. It's supposed to burn longer. It's supposed to burn cleaner than briquettes and hardwood lumps. And it's more dense, it's more compressed and has more charcoal in it per square inch, which I need because I need to pack in a lot of fuel to get that long 11 hour burn time. Pretty cool, right? But why am I doing this? Why am I going through all this effort? I even ask myself this sometimes. Since I had my firstborn, it's changed a lot of things in my life. I don't have as much time to just sit out by the smoker for like 12 to 15 hours a day and just tend the fire. I've got to look after Jacob. So it's been extremely tough for me to cook brisket consistently and get enough time to do it the way that I want to do it. So my hope is that if I can figure out this set and forget method, it'll allow me to continue to do my hobbies and I won't have to sacrifice not being able to smoke brisket anymore and just giving up on the things that I love to do. So I could just get a pellet smoker, I guess, but I just like offset smokers. I like the tactileness of it. I like the hands-on. I like uh, the flavor that you get out of it. And I just like the lifestyle and I don't want to give that up. So that's why I'm trying so hard to make this work and I really want it to succeed. So anyway, I set up my firebox with the basket. It was full of charcoal. It was snaked throughout those little makeshift dividers. I put in some wood chunks interspersed, not too many because I didn't want to overpower it. So I just put a couple wood chunks in that would provide smoke flavor eventually for when I did this with a brisket. I set up my meter probe to measure the temperature at great level and graph it overnight. And that's basically it. I just went to bed and hoped for the best. And I thought, hey, if this doesn't work out, then I'll just give up and I'll just use my pellet smoker, I guess. <laughs> when I woke up the next day, I looked at the temperature graph on my phone and I was blown away. It was actually still burning. And I think I had slept for probably 10 hours and the total cook time at that point was maybe 12 or 13 hours. And the temperature was still going strong at above 200 degrees Fahrenheit at that point. It was crazy. And I was so happy because I knew that I'd found the solution. All I needed to do was test it on an actual brisket. Now with only two days left before I had to smoke this brisket, I actually got another brisket from the store because my neighbor had asked me to cook one for her and it sort of came up suddenly, but it was a good opportunity because I needed a control for this test. I wanted to ensure that when I smoked this brisket on Saturday night, it wasn't going to be charcoal-y or taste like ash or some gross flavor. So this was a really good chance for me to cook a brisket, save a couple slices so I could do the taste test comparison on the Sunday against the overnight brisket, set and forget brisket that I was gonna cook. And for this control brisket, it was cooked the normal way I cook it. It was just 50-50 salt and pepper. I was running the Oklahoma Joe's at about 250 to 275. I was burning real hardwood. I wasn't using much charcoal at all. So if there was any flavor difference in the end product, I would definitely be able to taste it. And now with one day left to the barbecue, it was Saturday night. It was around 8 p.m. when I got started. I just filled up the charcoal basket with the coconut shell charcoal. I set up everything the way I had done it the two days before with the test. I put the brisket in, I put the meter probe in and actually set some temperature alerts on the meter so that it would alarm and wake me up if it went above a certain ambient temperature threshold, like above 300. And if the ambient temperature dropped below 200, it would wake me up as well. So I had a couple safeguards and I was pretty confident this would work, but I still wasn't really sure, but I had to just trust it. I went to bed, I hoped for the best, 
and I woke up the next morning. All right, guys, it's 10 a.m. in the morning, and this brisket's been smoking for about 11 hours now. I got a good eight hours of sleep, give or take, with the baby waking up every few hours. But uh, the temperature is holding steady at about 214 right now, which is a bit low. I don't know if you can see that. The problem is that uh, the brisket internal temperature is around 153, and it's been stalled out for about four hours now. So I need some higher temperatures to bring that brisket temperature up and actually finish the brisket. So we're gonna look at it right now, and I'm hoping that the bark is set, but the issue is if the bark isn't set, I don't really have enough time to keep on smoking it and adding more logs or heat or anything like that because I've gotta serve this brisket up in about two or three hours. So I gotta get it wrapped and I gotta get it in the oven and increase that temperature to get it done. So let's take a look at this brisket now. Here we go, let's take the first look. Whoa. All right, so that bark is looking pretty decent, but as I was worried about, it's not really where I wanted it to be. So let's take a closer look at it. Now it's pretty decent. It's a deep red mahogany and the bark is definitely set up on the outside. So it's not that bad. It's a little bit dry too, and it's not sweating out anymore. So that tells me that maybe it's been stalling out for so long that it's lost enough moisture, but I'm gonna call it right now. I'm going to wrap this guy and hopefully the bark darkens up a little bit more in the butcher's paper. That's what I'm hoping. And we'll find out how it tastes. And if it tastes too charcoal-y or like ash or anything like that, we're gonna find that out soon. Yep, we're good to go. Oh, okay. All right, guys, this is our barbecue. Barbecue in COVID times anyway, because this is all that we're allowed to have. We can't have huge parties anymore. So this is the first brisket that I cooked. I'm not gonna tell you guys how I cooked it. I just want your honest impressions. Melissa, are you excited? Super, super. Are you excited, Jackie? Yes. Okay, well, let's get your impressions. It's good. Tastes great. It's tender. Mm. Real tender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the bark? I do enjoy that. Mm -hmm. The bark's good. It's got some good uh, seasoning on that. Does the bark taste smoky at all to you? Like yeah, a bit of a mm -hmm. hickory kind of thing going on. Okay. Here. So it's, pretty subdued though. Yeah, the bite. I just took like a smaller bite that had more bark on it, and mm -hmm. it definitely comes through um, when in that bite. Mm. <laughs> that was the worst. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. No, but mm -hmm. it's like a really lighter flavor. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I'm getting to. Yeah. It's like kind of smoky, but not mm -hmm. too like overpowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do the second one. All right. So this is the second brisket that I cooked. I cooked this one today. So you guys go ahead, dig in, tell me what you think of it and tell me what the difference is to the last one that you just ate, whether it's better or worse. Oops. Mm -hmm. Do you inject this with something else? No? Mm. No, it, it is a lot juicier than the yeah. last mm -hmm. one though. Mm -hmm. I noticed when I was cutting into it, it like all this juice exploded out of it. Mm -hmm. What awesome. about the bark? Less smoky than the previous brisket in my view. Interesting. What do you think, Melissa? Your reaction was like... <laughs> Not like I'm leading you to any <laughs> specific answer or anything. I'm, I taste the smoke. I think it's a bit more pronounced than the last one, but not by much. Mmm. Mm. But does, it doesn't taste like charcoal or ashy or like gross or anything like that? No, no, no. Nope. Well, there you have it, guys. Mm. Mm. I almost forgot. And if you guys want to see another method of smoking a brisket overnight, just check it out over here. I'll, I'll put it mm. probably covering Jackie and Melissa's head. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be right in front of you. Click that one. 